Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate it. Wow. I'm impressed. How are we doing tonight? Well, the Hawkeyes had their victory, but oh my, how about those Cyclones yesterday? Wow. What an awesome game. My goodness, I enjoyed that. I was very proud of them. I think there were, were a number of conversions yesterday, people converting from the Hawkeye clan to, to the Cyclone side. I don't know. It was great to watch. Well, I did not, I did not, <laughs> I did not get my, my nap today, and so I'm a little grouchy tonight. And uh, someone asked me, uh, do you preach better when you're grouchy or, or worse? I said, I don't know. We'll find out. We'll find out. I'm afraid to even think about that. I'm so happy you're here, and I had some reflections back on the very first time that I went to an Assemblies of God church. I was a new convert, 17 years old, and I had become a part of a church that was not Assemblies of God. And one of the first things they told me was, stay away from that Assemblies of God church, they're a cult. And I had my baby sister, two years younger than I. In fact, she's got a birthday this week. She'll be two years younger than I am now. And uh, she was attending the Assemblies of God Church, and I was worried for her. So as her big and protective brother, I went to that AG church to check them out. And what impressed me, and I'll never forget it, was just that that presence of an unbridled joy, the expressive love, and I noticed they talked and sang about heaven a lot. We did that here tonight, didn't we? And I still am thrilled by that, the love, the joy, and the hope that characterizes the people of God. Aren't you glad you have that tonight? Amen. Well, I I have a true confession to make, and that is, when it comes to prophecy, uh, I'm I'm not going to go where I'm not comfortable. I'm not going to go where I can't speak with confidence and conviction. I'm uh, skeptical of these guys who have apparently connected all the dots in the prophetic scheme. They can tell us how it's all going to play out. I'm skeptical of them because if you get 40 of them in a room, they have 40 different opinions on almost every major aspect of future prophetic events. We call that eschatology. And each one speaks so dogmatically about their convictions. And I say that dogmatically. Uh, And so often we've tried to retrofit today's current events into the, the bits and the pieces and the hints and the highlights of prophetic words presented in apocalyptic language filled with imagery and symbolism. But we want answers, and a lot of people want to be the answer man, So we've been told that Hitler was the Antichrist, Mussolini was the Antichrist, Richard Nixon was the Antichrist, Barack Obama was the Antichrist. And I'm sure in some circles today, Bill Clinton, I mean, uh, not Bill Clinton, but uh, Donald Trump is the Antichrist. And all this time, I thought it was Hillary. (laughs) So I confess that there's a lot of the details in prophecy that I, 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 I don't know. I'm not absolutely sure about. But there's some things I know, some things I can speak with absolute certainty with an overwhelming sense of confidence. Here's what I know. God wins. Here's what I know. For the believer, there is no downside to serving Jesus Christ. 
none. For the unbeliever, there's no upside in rejecting Jesus Christ. Uh, here, here's what I know, dear friends. Jesus died. Jesus rose from the dead. And Jesus is coming back. So, if you came here tonight expecting or hoping for some kind of special revelation, some secret insight, you're going to be disappointed. In fact, some of you are already disappointed. But what I can give you is some encouragement tonight. Encouragement from God's Word. Would you please turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 9. The latter portion of verse 9 might be a good place to just pick up there. Reading from the New International Version, your version is just fine. It will say much the same. They tell how you turned to God, these Thessalonians, from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Now, I, I am not good at waiting. I have never been good at waiting. And, and I don't know what my problem is. Really, I, I don't think I'm that important. I don't think that the world owes me a faster response. Uh, many times, I'm not even in a hurry. I just don't, just don't like waiting. And here that word is, and I'm confronted with it. Wait, wait, wait for His Son from heaven. Those are not the words a guy like me wants to hear. You know, I confess red lights agitate me far more than they should. Missing one turn in a revolving door gets under my skin. I don't know where I'm going, but I'm in a hurry to get there. I'm better. I'm better these days, but I'm still not good at waiting. I'm better, but lots of room, lots of room and lots of need for improvement. So when I see this word wait, it leaps off the page. It's got my attention, and I know God's trying to tell me something. Let's explore that word, but first, let's meet the people to whom these words were written, the church of the Thessalonians. Paul has much to commend about this church, so very much. In fact, in this letter, there's no word of criticism or correction. It's all positive. It's all commendation. In verse 3, he commends them for their work produced by faith. Verse 3, their labor prompted by love, their endurance inspired by hope. In verses 6 and 7, they became imitators of Paul and models to all believers. Verse 8, their faith in God has become known everywhere. And there's one more thing we should note about the church of the Thessalonians, and that's that life was hard. Life was very hard. In verse 6, Paul acknowledges the severe suffering they were experiencing. It's in this context of suffering and opposition and hostility and trials and persecution. Paul's own words that he writes to encourage these believers. So from our text, let me briefly exegete and expound on three words, three truths that are given to encourage us all. And the first word is the word resurrection. Note in verse 10, 
Note the simplicity and the directness of the apostle. And if we have that, we can put that word up on the screen. If we don't, that's fine. Oh, there it is. Thank you. Verse 10, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. Well, how important is that? Well, it's all important. It's all important. If it didn't happen, we can turn out the lights, lock the doors, go home, and sell the building. We're wasting our time. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the very foundation of our hope. It tells us that there is a God, a living God, and He's got a Son. And His Son faced, met, and overcame death, and He gives us hope. Verse 9, this God is the living God. Verse 10, Jesus is the living Lord because He has been raised from the dead. He died. In chapter 5, verse 10, he died for us. But God raised him from the dead. This is the foundation of our faith. We have a living Lord. It all rests on his resurrection. As Paul said in Corinthians, if Christ is not raised from the dead, our faith is in vain. Our preaching is useless. Sometimes it seems to be that way anyway. We are still in our sins, and we have no hope. Now, those are four huge statements. Actually, four dilemmas if Christ has not been raised from the dead. I'll tell you, everything depends upon the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. That's why God made such a big deal about it. That's why He called in angels and gave many infallible proofs to testify of His Son's resurrection. That's why God apprehended Saul on the road to Damascus and turned him into Paul, the proclaimer of the gospel the risen Lord. And so really, in this tiny, simple, direct little verse, the greatest facts and events in history are incorporated. Jesus died. Jesus has been raised from the dead. And Jesus is coming back. And so Paul says, and we wait for his Son from heaven. How certain is his return? It's as certain as his resurrection. So the first word to comfort our hearts, to encourage us, is resurrection. Secondly, the second glorious truth that should encourage us is encapsulated in this word, and that's the word return. Because not only has Christ been raised from the dead, but He is going to literally, physically return for His church. The Jesus who rose and ascended into heaven is the Jesus who will return for, for us. And His return is as certain as His resurrection. Now, He says in verse 10, to wait for His Son from heaven. Well, how, how did He get to heaven? Well, we call that the ascension, His ascent into heaven. After His resurrection and multiple post-resurrection appearances and 40 days of teaching His disciples, Jesus ascended into heaven. Now, I don't know how He did it. Um, I find it amusing to try to visualize how that happened. I have no idea. Was it, was it slow, gradual, or was it, you know, like faster than a speeding bullet? I don't know. Uh, was it, did he ascend like this, or was it like this, or was it, I don't know. I don't, we're just not given much information. All, all I know is that he did it. And it left an indelible impression on all those who saw it. They were so transfixed by this ascension, they didn't want to leave the spot where they were. 
fact, an angel appeared to them in Acts 1 and said, You men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing into heaven? This same Jesus which has, which, uh, has been taken up into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Why stand ye here gazing? Get going. There's a mission to fulfill. So I don't know how he did it. I know he did it. And his ascension is every bit as important as his resurrection. But I've rarely heard a preacher talk about it. His ascension was the father's crowning statement about his son. He was taken up into heaven to be with the father and to sit at the father's right hand. What a divine endorsement. And from heaven... He's going to return. So he ascended to heaven, and he who has ascended to heaven is going to descend to earth's realm to gather his people from the ends of the earth. Paul elaborates on that in 1 Thessalonians, of all places. Chapter 4, in fact. For the Lord himself, he said, shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ. You don't have to worry about them. And in fact, if you and I are dead by that time, don't have to worry about us either. Because the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's a scripture we all ought to know. It's 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. And at the end of it, Paul says, Comfort one another with these words. Encourage one another with this truth of the Lord's return. Not long ago, I heard someone ask, Hey, brother, what's coming down? Well, I can tell you what's coming down, and I can tell you what's going up. He's coming down from heaven, and we're going up to meet him in the air. That's what we're waiting for. And to wait for his son from heaven. I've mentioned this before, and it certainly bears repeating. Paul talks about the coming of the Lord at the end of every chapter of 1 Thessalonians. Here in chapter 1 and to wait for his son from heaven. In chapter 2, verse 19, Paul says, when he comes. Chapter 3, verse 13, when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. Chapter 4, verse 16, he shall descend from heaven. Chapter 5, verse 23, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And again, here in our text, waiting for his son from heaven. Now, don't misunderstand what that word waiting conveys. This waiting is not a passive resignation to inaction and inertia. No, my friend, this is waiting with clarity and calling, with purpose and focus and alertness with an on-the-edge-of-your-seat anticipation. This is waiting in verse 3 with endurance inspired by hope and to wait for His Son from heaven. But too often, the world doesn't believe in the second coming, and the church, frankly, isn't interested in it. Too often the world doesn't have the stomach for it and the church doesn't have the heart for it. Too often the world is only interested in the world and the church is only interested in the church. We should be waiting, waiting for Him, waiting for Him every day, waiting every moment, waiting for His Son from heaven. That brings us to our third word of encouragement. We have resurrection. We have return. Thirdly, we have rescue. Verse 10, to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who 
rescues us from the coming wrath. Now, there's, when's the last time you heard that word, wrath, in most churches? And yet, here it is, and not only here, but you can find it again in the same letter in chapter 5, verse 9, where Paul says, For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Wrath, that forgotten word. That word you'll never hear from Joel Osteen. He and a growing number of others have written this part out of the script. Well, we don't get to write the script. It's written for us. And it's not negotiable. It's still, thus saith the Lord, not thus saith man. A lot of people have rejected the notion of God, not because of the evidence. Understand that. But because they don't want to have to deal with a God of wrath. But here it is, and here He is. The background, the background of that word is, uh, is an amazing and enlightening study from the Scripture. Did you know Jesus said there is coming wrath? Paul said it, Peter said it, Jude said it, John said it, James said it, every prophet in the Old Testament said it, and yet we don't say it today. We're too enlightened and sophisticated. Wrath is a part of the biblical lexicon, like it or not, popular or not, talked about or not. You might be surprised how quickly that word is introduced in the Gospels. Introduced by John the Baptist. By the way, in association with the coming Messiah. Take a moment, look in Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 7. I guess you could say John the Baptist had a certain flair about himself. He said in verse 7, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, am I ever happy to see you guys? It just blesses me beyond measure to know that you are here among us today. Thank you for coming. No, not quite. This is John the Baptist. And he said to them, You brood of vipers. I'm not saying I've never been called that, but it's been a while. <laughs> you brood of vipers, you, well, that's sort of a like you low down snakes. Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Now, what is John all about? He's about the Messiah. That was his calling. That's, the, that's why he was sent by God, to point to the Messiah. The Messiah is coming. The Messiah is here. And what you need to be aware of regarding the Messiah is that he's capable of wrath. Verse 8, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Verse 10, he says, the axe is already at the root of the trees. In other words, the judge has come. The judge has shown up. The judge is here, and he's got the axe in his hand. And that axe is already laid at the root of the trees. And every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. The fires of judgment. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And we Pentecostals, we love to associate those two and wed those two and make them two in one. But I, I think that John is talking about two different baptisms. 
And John is saying you come to Christ and you can be baptized in his spirit. But if you reject him, you're going to be baptized in his fire, the fires of judgment. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and it will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. One of the most horrific and unforgettable images of judgment and wrath in all the Bible is associated with the coming of the Messiah. So, yes, wrath is a part of the biblical lexicon. What do we know about this wrath? It is a certain wrath. It's coming. It's on the way. It will be delivered. It's on Almighty God's calendar, and man can do nothing about it. The scoffers will not delay it one day or lessen it one degree. It's a coming wrath. We also would note it's a just wrath because Paul notes that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5. He says, God's judgment is right. And in chapter 1, verse 6, he says, God is just. So no man will be able to stand before God and point an accusing finger at him and say, hey, you blew it. You're not right. You're not fair. God knows what he's doing, and he never makes a mistake. And no one will ever be able to stand before him and and tell him that he made a judgment based on inadequate or insufficient evidence. No one will be able to stand before God and say, oh, God, if you only knew. Oh, he knows. He knows all about it. He knows better than we know. He is just and he is fair all the time, every day time. It's a certain wrath, it's a just wrath, but also we must take note of the fact and thank God for it. It is a wrath from which there is an escape. You see, not everybody is subject to this wrath. The same verse that talks about wrath, have you noticed, talks about rescue. Jesus, who rescues us, from the coming wrath. And again in chapter 5, verse 9, God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's really helpful to take 1 and 2 Thessalonians together to get a composite of the fuller picture. And in 2 Thessalonians, Paul begins a letter writing about the God who punishes His Word, not mine. Hey, I don't make this stuff up. I just, I just share it. The God who punishes those who do not know him and who do not heed his gospel. But then he also talks about the God who gives peace and pardon to those who are his holy people. Folks want to get entangled in the argumentation of when does, when does, when does the rapture take place? Is it pre trib, mid-trib, post-trib, is there a rapture at all? Listen, I don't worry about that stuff. (laughs) God's got it all taken care of, and He tells us in His Word that His child, no child of His, has to fear the wrath of God because the wrath that you and I deserved has been poured out on the substitute of the Lamb of God who was slain for our sins. And in place of guilt and shame, we have forgiveness. And in the place of fear and dread, we have hope. We have a rallying cry. We have a battle cry. We have a declaration to make, and that is Jesus is our rescue. And so what are the implications and applications to be taken? Well, I think there are certainly implications for the church. It's right here in front of us, and it's like, duh. One is to preach the second coming of Jesus. It's too important, and it's too much a part of this Bible to neglect. We used to preach it. 
I'm glad we're doing it now. Something happened to the church, and I don't think it's good. I mean, a whole lot of something's happened. But for one, we just got so distracted and enamored by this world. And we wanted our heaven now. And the prosperity preachers lined up to offer it to us. And like naive children, we sucked down their toxic milk. Second coming, who needs it? Please, just leave me alone. I'm making my heaven right here, right now. No, my friend, we need to teach it. We need to hold it out as the hope. We need to preach it. We need to study it. We need to believe it. We need to live it. Could I get a courtesy amen at this point? All right. Then I think there are personal implications to live in the hope that is ours. Live in that hope. That hope brings joy. That hope brings peace. It brings purpose. It is a hope secured by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Thank God we have a hope. The world didn't give it to us, and they can't take it away from us. We're going to heaven. So let that hope energize us to be faithful in our walk and, and to do the Lord's work and not lose heart. Let it motivate us to pray and work for the salvation of others so they too can be rescued from the coming wrath. You see, this thing is just too good to keep to ourselves. Can I get a witness? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Would you stand with me? Let's worship the Lord tonight. Pastor, Brett, music team, uh, anybody else who wants to volunteer, come on up and let's, let's do something here tonight. Praise God. Let's celebrate just a little bit. What do you say? Let's rejoice. Amen, amen, amen. Oh, lift up your heads, your redemption draws nigh, he said. Praise God. Not too bad for a grouch. <laughs>